This video was brought to you by Slidebee, a platform for startups and small businesses to create professional investor decks and sales presentations. Get one free month by signing up at slidebeancom slash YouTube. Chances are you've heard the news, but in case you haven't, Hertz, one of the biggest rental companies in the world, has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Taking into consideration Hertz's sheer size alone, the consequences of this event will ripple throughout. Yes, 2020 dealt a fatal blow, but you'll see that it wasn't the only reason. In fact, many of the wounds were self-inflicted. Plus, we'll dive into the bankruptcy itself and try to shed light on the ethics behind these processes. In this episode of Company Forensics, let's see why Hertz went bankrupt. Go from the start. We go back to 1918, that's right, 102 years ago, and that's how old this company is. Originally known as Rent-A-Car Inc., it was the brainchild of Walter L. Jacobs, who started his venture with a dozen Model T Fords. Within five years, his company had a fleet of 600 vehicles and turned in $1 million in revenue, and these were fantastic numbers for 1923. And then this caught the attention of John Hertz, who owned a truck and coach company. He purchased Rent a Car and named it Hertz Drive Yourself System. But get this, he kept Jacobs as president. Jacobs even remained as president after General Motors became interested in the successful venture and purchased it in 1926. GM went into an aggressive expansion plan, which included airports such as Chicago Midway, as well as opening in Canada and, after World War II, their first European location in France. But John Hertz wasn't done. In 1953, he repurchased the brand through another of his successful companies and created what we know now as the Hertz Corporation. Then he purchased a truck leasing company with 4,000 trucks. So by 1954, Hertz Corporation had 15,000 plus trucks and 12,000 plus cars. In 1967, Hertz sold the corporation again, this time to Radio Corporation of America, which held on to it for almost 20 years. In 85, UAL Corporation Corporation purchased it for $590 million, only to sell it two years later for $1.3 billion to Park Ridge. Just a detail, Park Ridge was owned and operated by Ford Motor Company, and Hertz worked well for Ford. In some years, the rental business became up to 10% of Ford's profits before tax. Under Ford's ownership, Hertz grew even more. In 2002, it even became the first international rental company to open in China, a very lucrative market. But though it had been lucrative for for some years, Hertz was a bit of a headache for Ford as they faced tough times of their own. So it changed hands once again. And I really want you to remember this particular deal. In 2005, Ford sold Hertz to a private equity group composed of very big names, including Mary Lynch for $5.6 billion, which is not pocket change at all. It was under this new ownership that in 2012, after two years of back and forth bidding, Hertz purchased $1.50 for $2.3 billion. And this gave Hertz 10,000 plus locations and presence in 150 countries total. And if you've watched this show before, you know how some of these big acquisitions end up going. Market standards and firsts. But before we go into that, let's talk about what made Hertz special. They were good at what they did. They created membership programs, on-the-spot delivery, and led the industry with innovations such as Sirius XM radio in 2000, car sharing in 2007, and photographic testing to ensure the state of rentals. Think of it as a before and after from when you rent and when you return the car. Hertz lost an average of $170 million a year in damages to its rentals. There was also a culture around Hertz. Since the 60s, it made alliances with different brands to provide specialty cars. Jaguar, XKEs, Corvettes, and modified Shelby Mustangs. Then they had a green collection with hybrids such as the Camry and the Prius, making Hertz one of the first rentals to venture into this sector. This made Hertz stand out and grow a lot. By 2014, Hertz had over half a million cars in the US alone, including specialty cars, hybrids, and luxury vehicles. A very expensive 
fragile business. When you have half a million cars, chances are you are not paying cash upfront for them, but rather you lease most of them and you also lease locations in places such as airports or hotels. Then you have to factor in fleet maintenance and the vehicle's depreciation. So this isn't a cheap business, not even close. Hertz did what many rental companies do. They use their own fleet to leverage credit in order to maintain it. With the profit coming from the operation, Hertz paid off the debt, or at least they tried to. And and in recent years, the company was just barely coming up with payments. The reason? Competition from other rentals, from Uber and Lyft, and global financial stability. Hertz's big problem was that their debt reached around $18 billion. But Hertz knew the risks. In their 2014 report to the SEC, remember this one, it's fun, Hertz Corporation recognized that their financial model relied mostly on acid-fronted debt, a debt that depended on the vehicle's value. This means that if the car value plummets, lenders can adjust the loan to better care for themselves. Basically, if cars are worthless, the lenders dish out less. So relying on fleet value works as long as all the factors are in order. It's like a house of cards. And what were the risks? Well, many, but one stands out, especially right now. Check out this bit of the SEC report. Risks related to our business. Our car rental business, which provides the majority of our revenues, is particularly susceptible to reductions in the levels of airline passenger travel. And reductions in air travel could materially adversely impact our financial condition, results of operation, liquidity, and cash flows. The past. Now that we understand the fragility of it all, we might say, oh, that's why 2020 killed Hertz. Let's go back to 2005 and that big acquisition. The private equity group purchased Hertz for 5.6 billion in cash, but they also had to take around $10 billion in debt. So what did the new owners do as soon as they purchased Hertz? They took out a $1 billion dividend almost immediately, because why not? Take for example, CEO Mark Frizzora, who shook the company to the core. He laid off employees and cut costs all around, which made sense when you're facing debt. And then he received a $19.2 million compensation package for it. Should you take them when your company is knee deep in debt? Mm, no. Then there's the 2012 merger. The idea was to buy out competition and expand operations, therefore having more income. Makes sense, but it meant another $2.3 billion to the tab. Also, there were some conditions. For Hertz to be able to buy Dollar Thrifty, they first had to sell one of their companies Advantage. They did, but four months later, Advantage went bankrupt. Antitrust experts investigated the sudden bankruptcy and found it to be a failure on all sides, including authorities like the Federal Trade Commission, which was questioned for approving the deal in the first place. The companies had two different computer systems that couldn't be integrated. Hertz tried to join the dollar, Hertz, and Thrifty physical occasions in airports, but to do so meant more investment. Dollar and Thrifty allowed the tires on their cars to wear out thinner than Hertz did. So to standardize the fleet, Hertz had to invest $30 million just in tire replacement. The merger was supposed to save Hertz $100 million, but ended up costing them $70 million. By the end of 2012, Hertz had $20.2 billion in debt. He kept cars for longer than usual, so the depreciation curve would soften in the accounting books. The older cars would go into the budget fleets like Dollar, Thrifty, and Firefly. But this backfired because consumers and authorities alike took notice. That SEC report we spoke of, well, in 2014, Hertz was charged with fraud and Frisora was fired, but he wasn't found guilty. Hertz had to settle with the SEC for 16 million, so then they sued Frisora and another three managers. And right there and then, a guy named Carl Ikan comes in. The good and the bad all in one. Ikan was a very successful businessman, but he is known as a predator of sorts, a corporate raider. He takes advantage of flailing companies, buys them, then strips them bare of assets, then sells the scraps. So when Ikan heard in 2014 that Hertz was a good brand in need of authority, it was right up his alley and he jumped in. He bought a total of 39% of the company and three seats on the board for 2.3 billion. He placed John Tague, a former United Airlines COO, as CEO when there was a better candidate, Scott Thompson, the former Dollar CEO with plenty of experience in the business. And Tague just didn't do right. He renewed the fleet with sedans when the market was shifting towards SUVs. Customers fled, so Ekin pushed to raise prices. After all, the rental car business is pretty much an oligarchy, and he believed Avis and Enterprise, the biggest competitors, would follow suit. But they didn't. 
Instead, they stole Hertz's customers with lower prices. The market was shifting more towards SUVs, so fewer people bought sedans. Sedans lost their value faster. In 2017, Tag left, and in came Catherine Marinello. She shrunk the fleet, shifted to SUVs, and made good progress. The company had nine quarters of earnings, and possible recovery was in sight. And then 2020 came along. Bankruptcy and reality. Debt was just too high, and Hertz failed to make payments on their leasing operations. But before declaring bankrupt, Hertz asked for a government bailout, which was rejected. One big reason was Ikan himself, who was worth $18 billion. So they had to file under Chapter 11. Marinello jumped ship, and in came Paul Stone. And let's talk about this Stone guy. Why would anyone want that job? Well, he made $700,000 in a single day as part of a retention program to keep executives from leaving. In total, Hertz's executives received $16.2 million. Sweet deal. Meanwhile, if you have seen our show before, you know what chapter 11 means, reorganizing and shedding to make profit again. At the moment, 20,000 people and counting have lost their jobs. Then there are the cars. In the US, Hertz had more than 500,000 cars, and they will sell many of those for bottom dollar. Right now, the used car market is overstocked and with very low demand. So other companies, dealerships, and even manufacturers are affected. You see, manufacturers like GM and Nissan Motors don't get much profit from selling to car rentals, but they sold in volume, which meant a lot of quick cash. Now everything is paralyzed and projections mention a possible recovery for 2022. So yes, 2020 did help in trampling Hertz. Even Econ, usually a predator, lost billions, but the company might have survived if it had taken another path, perhaps, one of less greed. Thanks a lot for watching. Be sure to subscribe to stay tuned with our weekly Company Forensics episode. See you next week.